Um, trước khi chương trình chính thức bắt đầu thì em xin phép được nhắc các anh chị đã đăng ký nghe hội thảo chương trình hôm nay bằng tiếng Việt vui lòng nhấp vào ô có biểu tượng hình quả địa cầu ở bên góc phải ở bên góc phải phía dưới màn hình của các anh chị để mình chọn ngôn ngữ bằng tiếng Việt để mình có thể theo dõi chương trình một cách tốt nhất ạ. So, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinars with the topic Toward Manufacturing 4.0, co-hosted by Adventist Austria and IMIT University in Vietnam. In today's webinar, we will have the chance to listen to and discuss with industry experts from Austria and Vietnam about Industry 4.0 with a focus on manufacturing actually manufacturing sectors and mechanical engineering have always been our key focus as Adventist Austria in Vietnam and in our head office in Austria. In fact, in March 2020, 2021, we will be organizing in our headquarter in Austria um, a, a global dialogue called Factory for the Futures. Um, where we expect an enormous uh, international key player in the manufacturing sector to join our global event in Austria. Uh, this is an online event and if you are as Vietnamese companies uh, would like to join our event with a number of exciting act activity where you have the chance to connect with international key player in the manufacturing sector, we will be able to uh, disseminate the uh, in, uh, invitation to you uh, at a later step and later on Mr. Dietmar Schrank, our commercial consular to Vietnam, will uh, be discussing more and give you more detail about this event. Um, uh, and today's uh, in our webinar today, it will be divided into two parts. In part one, we, we, we will give you an overview about Industry 4.0 development in the world and in Vietnam. Um, and we will see how ready Vietnam is for Industry 4.0. And in part two, we, we will um, have a uh, closer look at Austrian technologies and how Austrian companies can be able to have Vietnamese company to upgrade their industrial capabilities when it comes to manufacturing and engineering. And um, we would like to note that in part two of the event, we will have the Q&A section where the, audi or the audience, the participant can have the chance to uh, give the question to our experts but here, so if you have any questions, please type in the question in the Q&A box um, and we will be able to address your question to our uh, experts today. Um, also, we would like to inform you that after this webinar, we will organize a number of B2B online meeting events where the Vietnamese company will have the chance to talk directly with Austrian companies to know better about their technologies and how Austrian companies can be able to help the Vietnamese company to upgrade um, your manufacturing capability and how we can cooperate together. So if you are interested in any Austrian companies participating today, please feel free to contact us as Advantage Austria in Vietnam and we can be able to set up the meeting online for you and support you on in, in those meetings. So now without further ado, let me introduce our first speakers today, Mr. Roland Summers, the, dire the director coming from the Austria platform Industry 4.0. Mr. Summer will give us a presentation about digitalization and Industry 4.0. Please uh, welcome Mr. Roland Summer. Thank you very much and um, a very nice afternoon uh, to Vietnam. Could we share the, the presentation? Um, I'm a representative and, and the managing director of the Austrian National Platform on Industry 4.0. Um, and um, we, our aim is to improve the framework conditions to introduce Industry 4.0 in Austria and beyond. And I'm really happy to, um, to give a short presentation about our activities, about what uh, we believe is important for Industry 4.0, et cetera. So I'm just waiting for the presentation and then I would start.
Wonderful. Thank you very much. Maybe I can also um, click to the next to the next slide. Um, here on the left hand side, you see uh, two arrows um, and, and these two arrows represent where our two countries are positioned uh, globally. Uh, the, the blue one is Austria and the, the orange one is Vietnam. And on the right hand side, you also see and that is more uh, related to the OECD also the position of Austria. And, and I have to admit, we're a little bit proud that we are ahead of Germany. And um, next slide, please. When we look at Industry 4.0 and digitization from a macroeconomic point of view, we see that these countries that invest more in digitization tend to be on the one hand more competitive, and on the other hand, they tend to be more productive. And that is a huge motivation for a couple of countries, among these also Vietnam, but also Austria, to invest a lot in digital technologies. Next slide, please. And um, <clears throat> just very briefly from our point of view, what Industry 4.0 is all about. Basically, it's about digitizing the complete supply chain. Um, and we have the means, we have the, the computer power to do that. And we always tend to differentiate between smart products and smart production. We know of a couple of companies that have very intelligent and smart products, but an outdated production and vice versa. So we always try to separate it. When we talk about Industry 4.0, it's basically about connecting the real world and the virtual world. We see that more and more shifted to the virtual world. And maybe you have heard of the term digital twin, uh, where you can test out virtually a new product, a production line, et cetera. What we see and that is ever emerging is that there's a couple of new business models coming up around products and product related services. And we see that these companies uh, that um, provide services tend to be more um, successful than those that only present or uh, produce products. When we look at the production, work pieces and machines operate production autonomously autonomously and they are flexible, they are efficient, they're also resource efficient. Um, uh, and um, it's still a little bit of a vision, but customer needs are taken up by production in real time. But when you think of, for instance, of 3D printing, uh, there you could also um, produce something in real time. In, in some other areas or cases like uh, smartphones or cars that would take a little time still, but, but we are heading towards that. And the last point is that maintenance is regulated on autonomously. Next slide, please. So that's, um, that is how we see Industry 4.0 quite broadly. Um, and just very briefly, we talk about virtualization and I, met, and I mentioned that already. We need sensors and sensor systems for that. Of course, we need software for, for that and we need machines, the physical systems. These are then combined in cyber physical systems and that's the technological part of the game. But there are also three other points that are very important. It's work systems. So we see increasingly that work is being um, supported by work systems, exoskeletons, etc. Of course, it's about new business models. And what is extremely important is the domain knowledge, the knowledge of the workers, um, and that is key in, in various areas. And, and, the, and, and the, one of the biggest challenges, challenges is how to grasp um, this domain know-how. And we see that we, we see three levels of motivation. The first one is improved production, and that means reducing costs and improving efficiency. But it's also about new products, and these virtual platforms also encompass R&D platforms and can speed up the product development circles. So that's a, a second layer. And the third one is new business models and new and different ways to access the market. Next slide, please. And that is more on the, um, uh, on the microeconomic level. This is the potential of Industry 4.0 to reduce costs. And there are a couple of costs, and I would just like to highlight complexity costs, troubleshooting, et cetera. When we have predictive maintenance or predictive analytics, we, we have a huge potential to uh, reduce costs. And when you sum up all these potential of costs, that is one of the reasons why there's a lot of um, production still going on in, in Europe, in Austria, in Germany, in Switzerland, et cetera, because um, we have we were very early in investing in digital technologies. Next slide, please. 
Um, I would just like for, in two slides, very briefly talk about the national platform industry 4.0, the who and what the who is, and that is unique in the world. Uh, it's a foundation by a ministry, employers and employees associations at the same time. And we, uh, we have a couple of industry partners and scientific partners on board, and we try to improve the framework conditions jointly in Austria for industry 4.0. Next, uh, next click, please. Um, you, you cannot read it, but I just would like to give you an idea of how we see Industry 4.0. Of course, it's about technology, it's, it's about innovation, it's about research, but and it's of course also about um, new business models. But we also tackle the topic security. It, we see that it is increasingly important. We very much look at qualification and competences. Um, we, we, we have in focus norms and standards, and that is particularly global norms and standards. We look at the, uh, the worker, the human in the digital factory, and we will now start a new activity on resource and energy efficiency. And next slide, please. Uh, and I would like to highlight a few examples of what we deal with in the national platform industry 4.0 in Austria. One is on predictive maintenance, and there it's very much about exchanging good practice examples. Next click, please. Um, um, we have um, a project running on artificial intelligence, uh, and that's more on human factors of artificial intelligence. What do you need to consider if you introduce a new AI technology? Uh, we have a project running on job orientation, uh, to motivate more young people to do STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Next click, please. Um, we start a new working group on resource and energy efficiency. And the reason and the rationale behind that is we have to find an answer on what is the contribution of digitization to climate change and climate protection. And there we would like to tackle that. Next click, please. Um, we very much look at 5G, the next telecommunication standard, and how it can be used in a, a particular in a production environment. Um, and, um, and there we have a couple of first use cases with su successful implication, uh, implementations of these. Next click, please. Um, we look at the most important institutions that, that deal with standardization and of course norms in various areas, including security, manufacturing, communication, and the internet. Um, and next click, please. Um, we have a policy learning lab. We look at other countries and, and, and uh, look what interesting policy instruments they used and whether we could integrate it in Austria. And there we have a project running with Italy, with Germany, with um, Poland, Slovenia, et cetera. And another click, please. Um, and we very much look at new business models. And new business models is key. And currently, uh, one of our focuses on data sharing. This is the new trend, a new hype in Germany and in Austria or in, in Europe in, in general, um, how to improve processes by sharing data along the value chain. Um, next click, please. Um, this would be my, my very short intervention. And if you have any further questions, here you see my contact details. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rollins. And our next speaker is Mr. Nguyen Anh Nhung, the director from the Central Institute for Economic Management, Ministry of Planning and Investment. Uh, Mr. Nhung will give us a presentation about how ready Vietnam is and in, in the Vietnam context uh, when it's come to industry 4.0. Please welcome Mr. Nhung. Yep. Uh, okay, good afternoon from Hanoi. And uh, my name is Nhung and I'm working as the government think tank uh, under the Ministry of Planning Investment. And basically, uh, can I have my slide on, on please? Uh, and I think um, at this other CIM, we had very close contact and also uh, and interactions with the business community and the government authorities. And in, and in, in terms of the industry 4.0, we work directly on advising the government and prepare the national strategy on the industry 4.0, just approved by the prime minister at the end 2020. Uh, but other than that, we also work as a, uh, uh, 
as a policy makers in the in especially in uh, with regard to the international cooperations are at the APEC economic committee so I myself represent Vietnam at the economic committee of APEC and I'm leading the preparation of the structural reform strategy of APEC in the next five years and one of the key areas we work on is how to harness the innovations especially when the industry 4.0 is ongoing so, uh, so in terms of the context at, at this stage, I think uh, in Vietnam and uh, Vietnam and other countries in the regions are facing the risk of economic downturn. Certainly, in Vietnam and other Asia countries, uh, we we are having some sort of like quick re recovery from the COVID nineteen situation. But we understand the situation in other parts of the world, like the US, the EU is also quite complicated at this stage. So that might lead to some concern about the the future path of the growth recovery. And the COVID-19 um, pandemic also disrupted the service. The Cũng trade. làm gián đoạn à, những cái chủ dịch vụ và sản xuất công nghiệp. Như vậy thì một số các doanh nghiệp are switching more to the uh, new working mode and with that the use of technologies the, uh, is being... Khoa học nhiều hơn, khoa học công nghệ nhiều hơn. Uh, như vậy thì chúng tôi ghi nhận sự phát triển của việc uh, ứng dụng uh, công nghệ nhập vào uh, nhưng mà ngày uh, covid ngày nay thì càng thúc đẩy cái quá trình này càng lúc càng uh, tăng trưởng một cách mạnh mẽ hơn uh, và việt nam cũng cố gắng hết mức để chúng ta tránh cái bẫy thu nhập uh, trung bình uh, Uh, so regarding the digital transformation, uh, we, we acknowledge the fact that the, the digital transformation became more progressive in, during the, the context of COVID-19. Uh, in Vietnam, with some of the common uh, uh, assessment is that the progress in 2020 appeared to be larger than the, than the cumulative, uh, cumulative progress in the previous years. So the COVID-19 actually has some uh, Uh, good uh, effect in the sense that it boosts the attention and the effort dedicated to digitalization. And the policy framework at this stage, we have uh, concrete uh, uh, policy documents to support the, uh, the implementations of Industry 4.0. And the first one is the first one is the resolution by the Politburo in, in 2019 on the guidelines to uh, Industry 4.0. And after that, uh, next last year, we had the decisions by the prime ministers on the national digital transformations. And the other one at the end of 2020, prepared by my agency on the national strategy on industry 4.0. So these, these are the key documents. And we will start um, going with the specific policies from this year onward. Next, please. And there has been some arising opportunities and uh, there has been well-documented uh, uh, evidence of the opportunities from Industry 4.0. And the, uh, one, of the, one of them was officially uh, presented in the document, uh, in the research document jointly by the Australian Research Institute, CSIRO, and the Ministry of Science and Technologies on the future digital economy. And in that, they talk about the one example was about the use of wireless sensors that could have um, reduce the production loss in fishery cultivations. And uh, that's also lead to improvement incomes in Vietnam. And that, uh, that can be on, on sectors, but there are plenty of other areas, especially when we talk about 5G, the internet of things and the wireless sensors that can help in the production process. Next, please. And the other, and the other thing, the key point I want to emphasize is that Vietnam is still in, uh, active in the in the economic integration process. We have a, a range. Uh, uh, next slide, please. We we have a range of the uh, of the FTA with the with countries in the region uh, in the regions and the other one and others in uh, in other parts of the world. So uh, Vietnam is uh, having a number of FTA with the ASEAN, ASEAN and partners. And we are not to mention the new generation FTA such as the CPTPP and the FTA with the EU. We are concerned about the Brexit as well. And so after that, we also had a, a separate FTA with the United Kingdom of Great Britain and, North, and Northern Ireland. So that, that, that's how we try to, uh, to alleviate the difficulties of the 
COVID-19 in the context, and so we're going to try to boost the opportunities for for productions and export in the countries. And that's how that's one of the things we say that how we appeal to the foreign investors when they come when they choose to enter Vietnam. Next, please. But the FTA's effort in Vietnam are not over yet. Recently, we signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, but there are other opportunities may arise. For example, if the United States return to the TPP, it has been an, uh, uh, a reopen for a discussion now at the, at the research level, but at the policy level, there, there could be some hint uh, soon in the, in, uh, I think, and the other one is that if the CPTP expand the membership, we have, we are in the CPTPP already, but the market can be expanded. For example, if the United Kingdom join the TPP, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, and uh, and and South Korea there, and of course in the future the Asia Pacific is still uh, um, active in the economic integration process, so there might be some uh, room for establishing the free trade area of the Asia Pacific region. Still a long way to go, but it's not a zero possibility. Next slide, please. So with that, I think I'd, I'd like to end my presentation here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jung. Our next speaker is Mr. Dietmar Swang, our Austrian Commercial Consular to Vietnam. Mr. Dietmar Swang will give us a presentation about uh, opportunities for Austrians in Vietnam in the manufacturing 4.0. Yeah, thank you very much and welcome uh, also from from my side. So I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about in what areas uh, Austrian and Vietnamese companies could maybe work together when it comes to Industry 4.0 and also why there is uh, why there are actually opportunities for both countries in that sector in, in collaboration. So let me start uh, by just putting into the picture where Austria uh, is and how big Austria is for, for maybe our Vietnamese, uh, or some of our Vietnamese audience who may not know that. Austria is, uh, of course, part of the European Union uh, with a population of 9 million uh, people. And uh, I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, we are a very export oriented country. We export to more than 200 countries in the world. And Austria is actually uh, ranked number seventh in the world when it comes to exports per, per capita. So we are quite out looking, have a good relations, I would say with uh, many Asian countries and also with Vietnam. Next slide, please. So this is a, a graph of the bilateral trade between Austria and, and Vietnam. And as you can see, we import a lot more from uh, Vietnam than we actually export to this country. Uh, and especially imports, but also exports have uh, developed very well over the last 10 years, as you can see. Uh, of course, there's a little downturn uh, last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but we have all reasons to believe that uh, the figures will grow again. Next slide. So what are we, what are we uh, exporting to, to Vietnam? I think this is a very interesting uh, graph. It's a very simple graph also, and it uh, explains uh, what kind of product categories we're exporting from Austria to Vietnam. As you can see, the most important one is actually machinery. Uh, about one third of the Austrian exports to Vietnam is machinery. And there's also a very big share of uh, instruments which also may include smart uh, instruments for the industry and also electronics, for example, uh, is, uh, is, a big, is a big value here. So we are really a country that is supplying industrial supplies uh, to Vietnam. Of course, also some other products like pharma products, but uh, the main part is actually industrial supplies. Next slide. So what is uh, Austria as a partner in manufacturing? Uh, I think I should say, I mean, Austria is one of the leading countries really in uh, machinery, plant engineering and uh, developing industrial equipment. We are located, uh, you know, in, in, in the middle of Europe uh, with very close relations, of course, to our neighboring countries. Some of them are also strong in that, but Austria has found its niche uh, in, in uh, industrial engineering. And we can say that we are among the top leaders in Europe and worldwide in that sector. 
Now, the expertise of Austrian company uh, includes many fields. I will come back to that uh, later, but just to give you an overview, uh, Austrian companies are really very strong in metal processing, metallurgy, plastics and mining, for example, all sectors where we have applications of industry 4.0. And what is also interesting in Austria is that there is a predominance of small and family owned enterprises uh, with an average of only 100 employees, so they are very specialized uh, and flexible also. Next slide, please. So uh, you as Vietnamese companies, you can actually benefit from Austria a lot in many ways, uh, I believe. And uh, one way of looking at this is uh, to have a look at Austria's hidden champions. We call it hidden champions. Those are companies uh, which are among the world leaders or even dominating as a, a very special niche where they're operating in. They don't have maybe many uh, competitors and uh, offer very specialized solutions. And this is because, possible because uh, uh, we have high engineering capacities uh, many Austrians and uh, Austrian entrepreneurs have even a personal obsession, I would say, with the quality of the product they develop. And we like to serve uh, customized products, which is what Austria is fam famous for, flexible products, uh, uh, customized products to uh, Vietnam. Now, we, of course, and I think we can say that as the official trade representation of Austria, we are uh, interested in uh, long lasting relationships with uh, Vietnamese companies. And uh, if you cooperate with Austrian companies, you normally have a small or medium sized uh, company that you, that you talk to and a company that is highly innovative. And uh, typically these companies in that sector would invest 8% uh, of the turnover uh, in R&D. And, uh, and, and resource development sort of, which is quite a high value if you compare that to the 2%, uh, which is the value across, across the European Union. Next slide, please. So again, let me come back to the uh, industrial strength uh, and manufacturing and engineering strength in Austria. On the one hand, we have uh, metallurgy, um, you know, steel uh, processing, steel making also uh, Austrian companies are quite active in Vietnam in that sector, especially in the north where you have uh, steel um, manufacturing. And then a very important sector is obviously also plastics processing that ranges from injection molding machinery to extrusion machinery and also recycling technologies, for example. Also here we're quite strong uh, in Vietnam and we also have uh, companies today here participating from that sector. But on another hand, we are also uh, a country quite famous for plant engineering and delivering turnkey plants in different industries that may include the paper industry, the chemical industry, uh, or also the uh, packaging industry, for example. And uh, usually the solutions for these sectors come with high automation uh, degrees. I think we will talk later in the panel discussion about automation also in Vietnam. Uh, and this is for sure also one of the strengths that we have in Austria. Other sectors include also automotive. Uh, you may know that Austrian companies have been involved in the development, for example, of the engine uh, of Vinfast, which is uh, Vietnam's first own uh, automotive uh, car pro producer uh, here. And uh, we have been involved there. Um, and uh, other industries uh, where we're really strong is mechanical engineering, metal processing, I did mention that. And then of course, anything related to advanced manufacturing technologies and the digitalization of the industry. So there's many niches, many sectors where Austrian companies can provide expertise and we are very uh, happy of course, to support any cooperation in such fields. Next slide, please. So let me uh, quickly uh, mention where we see that actually Vietnam can use Austrian industrial expertise. For one, of course, it is about upgrading industrial capacities of small and medium sized enterprises or even large companies here in Vietnam. We know that there is a big need 
uh, in investment and in upgrading uh, industrial capacities in many industries here in Vietnam. And this is one area where Austrian companies can help. Now, on the other hand, and uh, Mr. Sommer mentioned that at the beginning, Industry 4.0 makes industrial processes more efficient. Uh, Mr. Sommer talked about different types of cost savings. Uh, and this is also a sector, of course, where Vietnamese companies may want to invest in technology in order to have cost savings uh, on, other, on, on, on other issues. And this is, again, where Austrian companies can provide uh, technologies and solutions here. And third, I would say, uh, when it comes to increasing the precision and the quality of products in the manufacturing process, in order to satisfy the demands of uh, export uh, clients of Vietnamese customers, for example, those clients that companies here may gain through the different free trade agreements that we have heard of, uh, this is also a, a typical reason also to work with Austrian companies to develop that. So it's all about optimization of the supply chain, about increasing the strength and competitiveness of Vietnam's industry. Next slide. Just to give you a few examples, uh, I did talk already about uh, the energy development and also the end of line emission test at Vinfast, which has been engineered by an Austrian company, AVL. Uh, and here on the right side, you will see Vietnam's first uh, bottle to bottle PET, PET recycling plant, which uh, very recently uh, was delivered again by an Austrian uh, recycling specialist. So these are just a few examples. Of course, we can do many more things and uh, several Austrian companies are present here today and we'll explain later on in the panel discussions also their approach, their technologies and how uh, they think they can apply technologies here in Vietnam. Next slide, please. My colleague did mention already this uh, conference. So I would like just to uh, add a little bit to that. Advantage Austria, which is our head organization, is the International Trade Promotion Organization of Austria. And we are hosting large conferences in new and modern uh, technologies, in this case, on the future of machinery and, and, and production. So we call it the International Machinery Forum 2021, the factory of tomorrow. It's an online conference, a virtual conference taking place on 11th and 12th of March in April. And it does not only include a number of conference sessions on specialized uh, manufacturing topics, but also B2B meetings that you that you can have. It's a very international conference. We expect uh, over 600 participants from all over the world. And you will receive uh, later on also an invitation to register here. Since it's online, it's very easily accessible. Next slide. OK, so this was uh, my presentation. I uh, hope uh, I could uh, manage the time. And I'm giving back to my colleague to introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dismas Frank. And our next speaker is Dr. Nguyen Quang Trung, who's the head of the Department of Management from IMIT University in Vietnam. Dr. Trung will give us a presentation about digital transformation toolkit from IMIT. Please welcome Dr. Chung. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hoan Hien. Um, good afternoon, everyone uh, from Saigon South uh, campus of RMIT. Uh, it's my great honor to share with you our research um, finding. Uh, the other two speakers already touched on the uh, kind of macro uh, things on Vietnam and also the uh, related relationship and all the roles about Vietnam and Austria, which is great. And my presentation will will be looking at how, at the firm level, right? How the firm can activate their presentation, uh, sorry, their uh, digital um, transformation. Uh, but before I go for that, I would like to take this chance to uh, thank the um, CODE, I mean, Coach Center of Digital Excellence at RMIT. Uh, we have been, and especially its um, director, Associate Professor uh, Jerry Watkin, and also the co-author of, of this uh, research. Um, you may know that as RMIT, the T in RMIT represent for technology. So a lot of our research central 
in the um, technology. So these are transformation, smart transformation are the core parts of our research agenda. Thank you very much. Now get down to the business. Can you uh, get this uh, slide up, please? Uh, Tim. Next one, please. All right. Our research showed that the um, digital transform, uh, transformation journey uh, in any firms, they require is a long-term commitment at all levels of the enterprise, right? And um, for the past two years, uh, RMIT scholars collaborate with uh, KBMG and they generally uh, provide a, a great grant for us and we did the research. And many leaders from S SMEs and also SOE, they show in that we have a, um, they invest significantly in the technology, but uh, many of them also show that they do not have a, a great or coherent strategy in place. Also, our research also find out the five causes of failure for those who implement the digital technology or digital transformation in Vietnam. So therefore, RMIT, they, we are creating a framework, framework to, to help the Vietnamese business to plan, to plan and activate and ascertain. Uh, due to the time limited, so I will focus on the uh, activate phase of it activating information. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Right. So what are the important steps for the firm if you plan for a digital transformation? Uh, the first one, the firm need to create a self urgency. So the leadership and the staff need to know about the urgency of, of the you know digital transformation. We know from many other lessons that if you don't go for this, you can lose your business in, in the short term or in medium term, or you may not be successful. And then identify the the pain points, the pain point that the your company face, and then you have the relevant, you know, determine the relevant digital strengths that the firm have and where you want to, to get to, and then frame the uh, digital challenge to, to overcome. So that's, that's in the plan phase. More important that how we activate the next one, please, next slide. So how can, in this, in this phase, it's very important for us, especially the step eight and nine. But first of all, you have to focus on the digital investments and then you mo mobilize the resource because that's the resource consuming uh, process and, and you need to plan carefully. The most important is the building transformation management capacity and building digital uh, capacity. I will come back to that one a bit later on. But the certain, the certain phase that you have to measure the effectiveness and then you motivate the people, the stakeholder in that process, including incentive and rewards, and then sharpen the skills to certain. And do all that, you will lead to the result. The next one, please. The result will be either or both of the completely new business model, or you substantially transform your current business model by providing you know, optimize business process or enhance the customer experience. So this is the framework, but this is quite theoretical, right? We, we do provide a tool and do process and also to measure all of this. So now get down to the, um, the main the focus of, of our presentation that is activating the uh, digital transformation. Next slide, please. So in this, a lot of firms that we did research, they normally have the common mistakes that they pay too much or they invest too much on the digital part of it, so we call digital uh, capability. But they overlook at the, the another capability which is transformation management. That's, that's even more important. We know that many people already mentioned that in digital transformation, it's, it's even more about the transformation than digital. Okay, so now let's, let's look at, you know, closely what's in there in the transformation management cap capability. Next slide, please. So when we look deep into the um, K 
capacity of the uh, transformation management, we look at three pillars, the governance, the strategy, and the culture. So how can we transform from the existing one, which means the very beginner, to the more advanced one? Next slide, please. So we look at the uh, governance, for example, we, we have to go from the little or no awareness of, of the DT, it means digital transformation and no clear funding, no resource allocation for it. To go towards to the clear policy, leadership and ownership of the DT, right? And all the risks and opportunity are well considered at the board level. So I, I emphasize here the leadership at the top level of the company, right? It's, it has to be top down. From strategy part of, part of view, you have to you go from the no clear consistent DT plan and you know, Rona's uh, no responsibility, you know, nothing defined, go to the, 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 the phase whereby the level whereby the digital agenda is shared across the organization and, and link between digital KPIs and business drivers. And for the culture, culture of the beginner or, or almost nothing, they normally is not conducive to digital transformation. A lot, a lot of chain management, openness, and that sort of thing. We do have more certain, but due to more more detailed list of this, but but due to the time limit, so I, I have to go with the very general and high profile. They have to go from there to more digital learning parts of the organization culture, and the willingness, also the readiness of to, to embrace the transformation. So these are the capacity that we 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 emphasize to the firm and say that it's even more than the digital itself, right? So we call the first one, important one, that you need to activate the transformation management capacity. So the second part is, next slide please, is about the digital capacity. We, we emphasize the third, the third part, but this is also important, right? So you can't transform without technology, right? But it does mean techno technology alone. In here, we, we emphasize the digital capacity. We look at another three pillars, technology and cybersecurity at one pillar. And the other one is data analytics. And the last one is competencies. So can you go to the next slide, please? So in this slide, you can see that we have to go from a little, for the first part, right, technology and cybersecurity, go from a little or no investment in, in ICT and, and latest technology technology infrastructure to more platform business to, to the process of for, for the administrative control of the system and protocols to manage the data assets, uh, access. And for data analytics, we go from few or nothing to or little business value you know, that comes from data to more, you know, more data or share data and analyze, optimize business process using the data from uh, the data that we have. And finally, from the competencies, you know, we go from little competence in relevant emerging tech or inability to capture or analyze data, we go to the more digital learning part of the, you know, culture of the organization, especially willing and ready to, to embrace the uh, transformation. So in a nutshell that we, we look at the two and you have to activate, you have to activate the two important uh, capability in, in this transformation. Next slide, please. So we, we you know, if, if you look at the overall, it's it, the whole process, but we emphasize on activating only. At RMIT right now, we're building, and this online, right? So we can support, we even measure each of the pillar or each of the capacity and overall uh, score of your of your firm um, digital transformation and then from there we can tell you that which way which strategy in the firm uh, but due to time limited I can't present all so you see that we develop everything and we, we can have organization so if you need further detail or you need you know get more trainings or, or, or the related things you go to details that we provided in the in last slide uh, either contacting our team, me, or, or other team like um, our uh, associate professor, uh, Jerry Watkins, at the, um, the, at the court at RMIT Center of the Digital. Excellent. Thank you very much. I, I hope that I, I keep in the time within 10 minutes. So thank you very much for your listening.
Yeah, you did. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Chung. And that's the end of part one. And uh, now I would like to move to part two. And uh, I would like to invite again our commercial counselor, Mr. Dietmar Schwank, who will be the moderator for this part two. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ian. And uh, uh, please bear with us because uh, I think we're now getting to a very practical part and also the part where we try to share uh, experience and expertise between the Austrian uh, speakers, especially the companies that I'm about to introduce and also the Vietnamese side and of course also the audience today. So if you have any questions throughout the panel discussion or anything that come up yet, uh, in your heads that you want to raise as a question, as a comment, please put it uh, in the uh, Q&A uh, tab on your screen. And uh, I would like to start now with introducing the panelists. Uh, you know already Mr. Win Ang Jung, who is director for the Central Institute for Economic uh, Management. He was a speaker just before, so he will join also the panel discussion. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Win Tang Bing, who is a uh, senior program manager and uh, specialized in uh, digital technologies and also applications for the industry. He is from the RMIT University. Dr. Bing, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to contribute to this session. We look forward to it. Uh, and then uh, let me introduce uh, five uh, Austrian companies. First of all, Mr. Thomas Conrad. He is Vice President Far East Asia for the company Ferrobotics Compliant Robot Technology. So this is a company specializing in sensitive robotic equipment. Mr. Conrad. Thank you very much, Mr. Schwan, for the introduction. A uh, very good afternoon from Bangkok and also a good morning to Austria. And looking forward to uh, participate in the panel discussion. Thank you. Yeah, we, we look forward. Thanks for attending. Then we will have uh, Mr. Michael Kreil, who is a regional director uh, of Bruca Alicona, uh, a developer of 3D optical instruments for production, smart measuring, you could say. Mr. Kreil. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, warm regards to Vietnam. And I'm looking forward to a nice discussion with all of you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and the only uh, woman today, I'm afraid, is Ms. Sabine Kreuzmeier, Sales Director of Rubik Plant, Inge Rubik Plant Engineering. Uh, this is a company specializing in heat treatment, uh, hardening solutions, and coating solutions. Ms. Kreuzmeier. Good afternoon. You... Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Thank you for having us here and for inviting us. Good afternoon. Uh, and next one is Mr. Hans Seebacher, Regional Director Asia for VFL Milturn Technologies, uh, a maker of metal processing machines, for example, turn, turning and milling machines. Mr. Seebacher. Hello and good afternoon. I'm looking forward for the discussion today. And let's see what, which questions coming up. Looking Thank forward. you very much as well. And uh, last, not least, Mr. Chokri Karabach, who is an area manager for Greiner Extrusion, a, a company specializing in plastics extrusions, especially profile extrusion. Uh, and uh, this will be the fifth Austrian company that we're going to present also. Hello, everybody. Best regards to Vietnam. And I'm looking forward to talk to you soon about extrusion. OK, great. So then uh, I hope we will see all the all the panelists uh, in a moment because we don't have any 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 slides to share with you at this moment at least. Um, so uh, you know these Austrian companies will of course all present a little bit also about their technologies, but very specifically they will share uh, their expertise and how they think they can incorporate Industry 4.0 related technologies as an integral part. Uh, of their of their product offer. Very often this comes with the benefit of cost savings in the manufacturing uh, process. So we will not just uh, give you a series of presentations, but rather talk about certain uh, topics with our panelists and then also ask uh, one after each other, the Austrian companies to contribute by introducing themselves a little bit. So let's start with uh, maybe robotics. Uh, Vietnam, as we know, will very soon be 
the fifth largest market for industrial robots in Asia. And the demand from uh, uh, companies looking uh, to use uh, robots to modernize production is actually quite strong. And the growth in this sector in Vietnam is more than in most other countries here in the region. So I would maybe like to address the first question to uh, Dr. Bing. Uh, what role does robotization play so far in Vietnam? And what can we expect in the future uh, in this sector? Yes, hi Dietmar. So thank you for this question. So actually, as pointed out by the Vietnamese Deputy Minister of Industry and Trade, uh, the core of the fourth industrial revolution is smart manufacturing. And I think uh, a key element of smart manufacturing is here having robots collaborating with humans in a workspace environment and where robots can do the repetitive and heavy tasks to make the production process more efficient and effective. Um, so far, Large companies have benefited most from automation in Vietnam uh, or robotization in Vietnam. For example, Vinfast car manufacturing complex is considered to be a smart factory, uh, which was um, made possible by uh, a wealth of foreign production technologies, including technologies from Austria. Uh, another example I would say is uh, Wiener Milk, um, who is uh, Vietnam's leading dairy producer um, that use robots to transport and sort goods. So I think moving forward from here, uh, I strongly believe that robotization and automation in general will become even more important in Vietnam in the future, um, helping to make the production process as well as the economy more competitive in the region. So this is what I expect for the next um, decade to come. It is also what we expect for sure, especially since Vietnam has to upgrade certain facilities in order to remain competitive. And I think there are also policies uh, in place to support that. Um, now, when we talk about robotics, this has many aspects, of course. Uh, the company that we would like to present today is Ferrobotics Compliant Robot Technology. And you could say they're making add-ons to robots. If I'm, if I'm not uh, wrong, uh, Ferrobotics is a world leader in the development and the sale of uh, what we call flexible and intuitive robotic uh, equipment. So you could say they equip robots with sensitivity, uh, which makes them more flexible, more reliable, more economical, and such optimized robots adapt themselves to suit uh, complex surfaces, for example, meaning that they are able to automatically measure uh, and determine the amount of force that needs to be applied. So there are many different applications for this. And I would like to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Konrad uh, from Ferrobotics to give his introduction and tell us more about his company, please. Sure, perfect. Thank you very much. So as, um, well, my name is Thomas. Um, I'm working for Ferrobotics stationed here in Bangkok. And yeah, I will just quickly start with the presentation and give you an overview of what we do and what is possible. So please start the presentation. Meanwhile, again, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A section and we are happy to answer that throughout the panel discussion. Wait a second. Sure. Uh, we will share the screen now. Shares. I think someone is sharing the screen at the moment. So. All 
All right. The next slide, please. So firstly, just a quick introduction about Ferrobotics. We are an Austrian company uh, from Linz, from Upper Austria. And as Mr. Schrank mentioned already, uh, we are working in the field of robotics, auxiliaries to robotics. And basically what we do, uh, we are bridging uh, quite an important gap because the robot itself is of course a very important device for automation and also for industry 4.0. But on the other hand, uh, it's quite a heavy dump and dump device without feelings, without sensitivity. And this makes a lot of difficulties and applications uh, where the parameters are changing and where you have different behaviors of material position and whatsoever. So basically, in order to, to overcome this hurdle, to bridge that, um, we developed so-called active compliant technology. That means we give a robot a so-called human touch. That means we're able to uh, automate jobs which were done previously uh, manually and also jobs which are uh, quite in a hazardous environment and dangerous. Um, we give a robot the possibility to feel, it means to automate such applications. And yeah, as I said, the active compliant technology, uh, it's based on bionic principles. So we try to mimic a human hand and give the robot simply the possibility to feel. Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so what is the benefit? So first of all, we're closing all gaps which are so far existing in the automation, which also leads of course to reducing labor costs, but labor costs, it's one of the driving factors, but not the only one. So as I said, one thing is a lot of applications uh, are quite dangerous applications. We call it so-called uh, 3D jobs, dusty, dirty, dangerous, where it's of course uh, difficult to get labor, get trained labor, qualified labor, and also where uh, workplace safety is an issue. And more important, uh, we are also improving the quality. So that means not just automation, and reducing labor, we are also increasing the, the quality and of course, we add value to the product. Uh, just on the right side, I will not go into details. You see a few of our products and applications. So basically they're used in, in many industries. Um, and next slide, please. What I just want to do is to give you some uh, practical examples, what we are doing from, of course, our main industry, uh, which is the automotive industry, uh, where we have, of course, many uh, references among the, the leaders in the, in the automotive industry internationally. And what I want to show you here is first of all a video which was is done at uh, Porsche in Germany for the Panamera, um, where previously there was a manual job required for the primer sending, so the preconditioning for the paint job. And there we implemented, thanks to our active compliant technology, a fully automated solution for sending, which means we reduced labor force, we fully automated the process we improve the pain quality, we reduce the cycle time. So please start a video, uh, have a look by yourself. No, back. No, next slide and start the video in the slide. There is a video embedded. No, back, that's the wrong one. <laughs> yeah, so this one, right? Yes. So why we are doing that? So basically in a car factory, you have um, a lot of tolerances in terms of the, uh, of the transport system, but also the cars are different. And this is something which was a big issue in the, begin uh, in the past, but with thanks to our technology, no matter where the car stops or how the tolerances are, we can fully automate it, uh, send the surface. And this works without any uh, scanning system, without any detection system. It's fully based on our technology to give the robot the possibility to feel. So this was one example. So we, in order to save some time, we move on to the next slide, which is a similar uh, application uh, in the automotive industry, just in the further production step. So in the body in white, uh, where we, for example, uh, in a production step, which was also done manually, where some weld spreader, some weld suit is removed. Uh, this was done by several workers. And again, with our technology, fully automated. Start the video, please. So 
So again, high degree of automation, cyclotron. Of course, it's traceable, simple setup, and uh, what is important as well, it's a, a self-learning system. Okay, and next slide, please. So um, markets, basically, what are we waiting for? Uh, we have a multi-billion dollar market waiting for us, I would say in Southeast Asia. And it's not just the automotive industry, it's basically all industries. So we have customers starting from the aerospace down to jewelry and whatsoever. So basically we can do everything um, or we can work in many, not everything, but almost everything, let's say a little bit. And looking on our, our references, you see uh, Airbus, Boeing, like big aerospace companies, then all the players in the automotive industry, but also uh, many companies uh, which are in the general industry and not just limited to Europe, basically all over the world. Um, Europe is of course the main market, but number two is the Asian market. So next slide, please. That's everything from my side, a very short presentation, but of course, if you have more questions, you can uh, approach me directly, uh, or if you need some more videos, you can find them on our homepage and whatsoever. And yeah, thank you very much. And looking forward to your questions. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Conrad, uh, for sharing uh, your, your expertise here. We got actually one question, which, which we can uh, immediately try to answer live here. The question is, uh, how do you think about the value of the robotic market in Vietnam at the moment? And what is your forecast of growth in the next few years? Uh, and what are the challenges for assessing the Vietnamese market now? Maybe I can myself try to answer the first part of this uh, question regarding the robotic market here. And then I may also want to ask maybe Dr. Bing or any one of the speakers who can uh, add to that for, for further comments. So when it comes to the market size uh, for robotics here in Vietnam, you can actually look at the shipments uh, into the country and compare that also to other uh, countries in, in East Asia and Southeast Asia. And of course, when you, when you have a look at these figures uh, for, for, for this year, for example, uh, we have an estimation of uh, shipments of roughly 7,000 uh, robots to Vietnam. If you compare that in the region, it's of course, of course much, much less than uh, in China, uh, which leads the world here, of course, uh, with 290,000 shipments. And also it's much less than Japan, Korea, or Taiwan. But what's really interesting is First of all, uh, the growth rate here in Vietnam. Uh, if you look at these uh, statistics for a certain uh, period of time, uh, you can see that Vietnam is actually picking up and also will probably overtake uh, uh, Thailand and also India uh, in these statistics very soon. Actually, the growth rate uh, for, for this year uh, is supposed to be roughly 40%. It's really amazing. And uh, if it goes further in that direction, um, you know, Thailand, India, Vietnam are all the same size in this market. So Vietnam will for sure overtake that. Uh, Dr. Bing or any other of our panelists, do you want to add a little bit to the robotics uh, market maybe uh, or to uh, policies to support this market in Vietnam? Um, yes, thank you, Dietmar. So I think this is a very good question and I may try to at least give some insight from my side on that. So when we look at it from the macro perspective, so small and medium enterprise in Vietnam, they are estimated to contribute 40% to Vietnam GDP. So basically a huge part. And I believe that it is really crucial for, for uh, automation and robotization um, to, to grow in this market um, that they somehow are able to offer solutions for, for those small and medium enterprises. Because as, as um, we may know that uh, small and medium enterprises often uh, lack the re resources to make big investments to uplift their manufacturing process. So uh, I think that um, yeah, I think in, in the next decade, automation definitely uh, will, will have a yeah high growth potential. But for now, I see that mainly the big companies are benefiting from that. And the next step, since the Vietnamese economy is so heavily based on small and medium enterprises, is then, okay, how can we uh, offer solutions for these uh, small and medium enterprises to, to really move forward? 
this is from my side. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bean. Um, okay, so uh, again, thanks, Mr. Conrad, for, for, for presenting. Uh, one reason why Austrian um, companies are so strong, for example, in the field of uh, mechanical engineering, is also the ability of Austrian uh, people to, 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 to uh, you know, offer, I mean, to work on high quality solutions in their companies. And also one other reason is uh, dual education, which we have in Austria, which means that uh, people are trained both in theory and on the job. Uh, so we do have, uh, I would say, a, an engineering culture in, in Austria. It seems that uh, Vietnam also wants to engage in a growth path through upgrading value chains to get re less reliant uh, on uh, supplies from elsewhere here in Asia. And uh, maybe I'd address the next question to Mr. Jung, um, who is uh, uh, here also and who, who gave the first speech. He, he mentioned already a little bit about uh, Vietnam there. And uh, so Vietnam has been a country very strong in assembly actually in the past. Now, I would like to know what industrial uh, development policies and expectations are actually in place uh, in, in Vietnam so that the country can move up the value chain or in how far and in what industries is, mm. for example, smart manufacturing already uh, pursued? Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Dina. Uh, I think we're, um, I think in the last 10 years, Vietnam has been exporting a lot of, and, and, and think, I think the share of manufacturing sector has been increasing. But, over, but in the, and I think in the last few, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, we also start to see an, I mean, when we, during the US-China trade war and the rise of interest of foreign investors in, uh, in ASEAN markets, including Vietnam. Uh, we take this opportunity to renew the interest of Vietnam in, uh, in, in, elevating, in elevating the manufacturing sector. And, and at this stage, I think that mm, the good thing is the government is paying more attention to uh, increasing the connections between the foreign uh, investor firms and the domestic fir firms, especially in terms of the, of the productions of the intermediate goods and, and spare parts and materials for the manufacturing. Having said that, uh, it, the assembly uh, assembly of the final manufacturing product is still very important, but we pay more attention to the share that Vietnamese enterprise can contribute to to the process, and that's not really only uh, that's not only a, a perspective of protectionist, but I think that's also relevant to the foreign invested firms. We we, we talk to the companies in uh, the foreign investors in from a number of countries. And they said that that, that kind of thing is also relevant because they want to diversify the, the source of input for their product. So ha having a, to rely on import is not always good, especially in this context. And the second thing is enhancing the, the linkage with the domestic firms is also, import, is also important to enhance the image uh, of, of the firms uh, uh, in, in, the, in the domestic market. But uh, still, I think uh, the, we acknowledge some of the issues uh, with the, the domestic uh, and small and medium-sized enterprise. The first one is about the capacity, especially in terms of access to finance and technologies in the value chain. Uh, the second thing is uh, the ability to comply with the, with the different requirements in the value chains. For example, the ability to, ability to, deliver, to produce in mass volume, the ability to deliver, uh, to deliver just in time. So uh, I think that the Ministry of Industry and Trade are providing different capacity building um, on the, from the supply size. And they also work with foreign invest, big foreign firms such as Samsung and the other companies to, to have some sort of like you know, pooling effect on the, on, the, on the SME so that they can get to adapt to the real, uh, to the real value chain, uh, to, to higher stage in the value chains. But um, other than that, I think the Ministry of Industry and Trade is revising the uh, degree on the, on the supporting uh, industries, but that has not been finalized yet. And I think I, I noted that there, there is also a question in the Q&A box uh, regarding, the, regarding the supporting industries, but uh, 
that one is still uh, in the revision process. And uh, we understand that the Ministry of Industry and Trade wants to have some sort of like breakthrough in terms of supporting to the domestic SME. But that's also lead to some sort of like fiscal implications that may not be easily accepted in this context. So. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much for, for the comment. Also, thanks for answering already to one of the, of the questions that we have. Now, uh, we can see, of course, that uh, we can use uh, many different smart technologies to upgrade production uh, to make, for example, also precision tools and uh, components. One of such technologies is optical imaging instruments and technologies for surface um, measurements and surface analysis. A leader in this uh, and in a variety of such technologies is actually Bruker Alicona from Austria. Now, in fact, its application areas go far beyond uh, simple tool making uh, and includes also the aerospace industry, the medical or pharma industry, etc. Uh, and of course, this is a uh, technology also very crucial to additive manufacturing, for example. I would like now to ask uh, Mr. Kreil, representative of Bruker Alicona, uh, to give us some uh, input and uh, introduce his company and his technology in regard of 3D optical instruments. Please. Thank you, Mr. Schwank, for the introduction. To start my presentation, I would like to ask you to open it right now. But you are totally right. Yeah? Uh, we see ourselves as a provider for optical 3D metrology. And uh, we don't see us uh, or we don't see ourselves as a, let's say, offline auto uh, autonomously working part in this field. We see ourselves more as the integral, as an integral part of the production and integrated part of the production. And this is exactly where the trend goes to uh, from the laboratory directly into the production uh, to be an integrated automated solution uh, to be able to, um, uh, to quantify and qualify the production process and uh, at the end of this uh, process, uh, of course, the final product. Well, uh, with this image, I think it already shows a lot. It shows uh, that we do 3D uh, measurements of any kind of surfaces and materials. Uh, it could be almost everything, so we are not related to a specific um, uh, industry but everywhere where it comes to high precision manufacturing or the, where uh, digitalization of um, micro precision parts needs to be done, we are, we are ac actually a part of it. Um, just a few words to the company. Uh, with this presentation, I want to more focus on the, on the application and less to the company details, but please go once to the next slide, please. Yeah, we are founded uh, 20 years ago in Graz, Austria. We are now around uh, 150 uh, people in our business unit, but since December 2018, we are part of a Bruker Group, uh, which is uh, founded in uh, Germany, but now the headquarters in US with around uh, 6,000 6, people worldwide. And uh, in uh, especially in Southeast Asia and Asia itself, we are mainly working with distributors, but we're also trying to increase our direct stuff over there. And uh, one of our, let's say, key strategies is, as I said, to be part of the production, uh, to uh, drive our products more into the direction of production metrology and uh, be seen as an integral part of production. Next, please. Few words to the technology. Actually, the technology we invented and we uh, used and transferred to uh, industrial applications. It's called focus variation. Actually, it's a, it's a sensor including uh, illumination and a camera. So uh, what we do is we change the position from the sensor to the measurement object. And by analyzing the, the different images that we capture during the time, we can calculate from each measurement point the maximum sharpness. And with this actually sharpness information, if you click next, we are able to generate a 3D model out of it. And due to the high resolution and uh, the, the steep flanks that we can measure, actually we, are, we can measure form and roughness in one single measurement. Uh, please click next. And uh, 
by adding an additional axis uh, by uh, a, a third and fourth axis, no, a fourth and fifth axis, sorry, so a rotation and tilting axis, we are able to scan any part uh, from any direction in 3D and generate the complete form model out of it. Yeah? And this can then be used also for CAD comparison and uh, yeah, for reverse engineering as well. Uh, next, please. Uh, so with, with our technology, we can measure, let's say, dimensions, position, shape, and roughness uh, with just one sensor solution. Yeah? With, with uh, the sensor from Malikona, you can measure ev uh, basically every uh, feature of a technical drawing um, yeah, with one solution. Next, please. So this is an overview of, of our product portfolio. So it's actually a sensor-based solution. And this sensor can be uh, used for, let's say, on, on different frames and on different solutions. But uh, the, the principle of the measurement itself always stays the same. Um, next, please. And uh, yeah, as I said, we are in various industries. And everywhere where you need to measure form and roughness, we are actually a competent partner. Next, please. So, and as I said, we also want to be integrated part of the whole automation chain. And this is where the direction goes to. Uh, so that the first part is a good part uh, that we can deliver real-time data of the production process, uh, fully automation, automated solution, and that we are uh, integrated into the digitalization chain and network of the company. Yeah? So that's where we go to. and. Uh, Go to the next slide, please. So it should not be an autonomously system anymore. It should be uh, more or less, next please, uh, integrated uh, with the production machine so that they work together. And this is also shown, uh, let's say, on, on the next examples. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so we also uh, use uh, robotics in our solution. So uh, can you please, uh, yes, yeah, here you can start it directly from here, where we use robotics for the automated placing uh, of the of the samples uh, to our system. Uh, so actually, you have a worker bringing uh, the parts to the system. Uh, to replace the worker, you can also use an, an robot uh, if needed to have it fully automated. Uh, it's a collaborative robot, so you don't need any uh, security uh, um, facilities. And this robot is actually taking the part, bring it to the machine, and the machine automatically perform the measurement and give the results uh, as a report. All right, can we go next? So then we can also show the next application. Yeah, and then we have a 3D digitalized part uh, that you can use for form and roughness measurements. Next, please. And also here, it's a solution where we have an, uh, our sensor, our cobot system placed next to the production machine. And uh, you can do actually measurements in the machine that reduces uh, time of course, and you, you immediately know if you need to change uh, the tools to, uh, that are used to manufacture the part. So as you can see, we measure the tool. Uh, so if the cutting edge radius is within the specification, and at the same time, we also measure the part itself. For instance, how is the surface roughness on this part? Yeah, next, please. And the last example I want to give to you, it can be also integrated. Uh, I lost the presentation. Is it just not yeah. Or maybe I'm over time. That's why you <laughs> closed it. But it's, uh, it's just the last one, I think. And uh, or you can also integrate it into the production. Yeah, OK, let's follow up with that one. Uh, this is, let's say, the high-end, uh, let's say, solution where the measurement system itself, it's integrated into the production line. So uh, the machines are communicating with each other. And actually, this measurement system uh, tells uh, if a remanufacturing needs to be done or if the part is within tolerance or uh, which, which machine 
uh, or manufacturing cell uh, is the next one. Yeah? So it's an integral part of production. And we realized this project already with the customer in Germany, uh, where, as you can see, the, the produce part uh, is brought to the measurement system. It's uh, automatically fixed in the system. And the 3D optical sensor is uh, measuring the surface in 3D. Uh, analyzing the form and roughness and playing back these results uh, to the uh, production planning uh, system uh, that can control further production steps. Okay, I think this is good enough for a basic understanding. Next, please. And this is actually what we do, yeah? So um, I didn't see the contact information at the end, but uh, yeah. You can visit us also anytime on the website. And I'm not sure, Mr. Schwank, if our details information are also shown to the, shown to the uh, participations of this meeting afterwards or sent out via email. Then I think you will also be able uh, to see my contact details uh, in this introduction. Window. Yes, we do, of course. And thank you so much, Mr. Kreil, for the presentation. And right. again, for our uh, Vietnamese audience, uh, if you have an interest in talking uh, further to any of those companies, we're also organizing B2B meetings. So you may want to address us uh, if you have an interest in talking further with one of these companies. Now, uh, we have talked about sensitivity of robots and of optical sensors so far. And uh, again, you may call these some add-on uh, technologies to smarten your production process. But of course, there's also, let's say, the primary hardware, the machines, uh, to produce high-precision uh, components and so on. And we would also like to introduce a few of such makers of machines uh, among the next uh, companies from Austria that we're going to present. Uh, and I would suggest after this, so we have maybe one other company to present right now. And after this, we will talk in the panel a little bit about uh, the relevance of Internet of Things for manufacturing and also automation in Vietnam. But first, uh, let me introduce uh, the company Rubik Industrial Furnaces, uh, a provider of a variety of heat treatment and hardening coating solutions. Um, what is your company doing and how do you respond to Industry 4.0 or even shape it? Uh, Ms. Kreuzmeier, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, actually, Rubik, just to give you um, a little overview of what we are doing, Rubik actually is a group of companies. Um, so while we are waiting now for the slides, yeah. I'm just starting. So um, Rubik is actually taking care of uh, yeah, steels and aluminum and the treatment of it. So all of the Rubik companies, all of the Rubik daughters are handling materials, materials mainly steels and aluminum, as I said, um, either by forging it, either by mechanical machining it, uh, either by heat treating, and additionally by manufacturing um, machines for the heat treatment. If you go on to the next slide, it's just an overview on where we are sitting. So um, Rubik basically um, is headed in Austria, is situated in Austria. Uh, where we started with the forging. So we do have um, a forging shop where we manufacture mainly uh, things like piston rods, uh, linch pins, and uh, smaller forging parts. The second big division is heat treatment, commercial heat treatment, which means we get the parts delivered from our customers. Uh, we heat treat them, which means we harden them and send them back. and the third um, division uh, is the industrial furnaces division. And that's the division where I am now from or where we are now from. Um, we do have additionally service subsidiaries in, for example, USA, in China, also to be uh, nearer to the customer, to, be, uh, to um, uh, offer them services on site and so on. 
what also is quite interesting, Rubik um, is still family owned. Uh, we do have approximately 500 employees now, but still family owned and family owned since 1946. Um, yeah, you can choose the next slide, please. That's the division where uh, we are now from. So we're exporting. Um, we're also one of those exporting uh, champions in Austria, um, more than I would say 80, 85% in more than 43 countries. Um, next slide, please. So why do I mention it or why is, uh, why is heat treatment or the machines for heat treatment important for, uh, for your region? Um, when we are talking about heat treatment, we are mainly talking about nitriding and coatings. So surface heat treatment uh, of steel components. Um, and mainly, where you can mainly find them is for example, um, in the machine building industry, of course, we were talking about it already. Uh, when you look at the machine building, all kinds of spindles, for example, all kinds of gears, valves, um, or plungers, they are all nitrided, heat treated. Why is it important? Uh, they need wear resistance and they need corrosion resistance. Um, there are other industries we were already talking about today, for example, the plastics industry or the packaging industry. Uh, also their coatings are used a lot, for example, for, for cutting tools, for knives, for machinery, uh, also for molds and dyes uh, which, are, uh, which are needed there. And we were also mentioning, for example, the food industry. So all kinds of um, all kinds of, of screw conveyors or roll, uh, rollers or knives again, all of these parts need heat treatments or coatings in order to be uh, to prevent corrosion and and wear. So just a short uh, uh, information or background here why it's important or which technology we can um, we can contribute in that case or in in this region. If you go to the next slide, um, it's a kind of introduction of, of, of Industry 4.0. I, I don't want to talk about this now because, uh, because everybody knows what we are talking about and everybody knows what, what digitalization is about. But um, what, uh, what you see, so the, the black, the black um, fields, what you see are mainly the characteristics of, of digitalization, yes, but you always need a lot of tools to, um, to engage that or to reach that. And that's the reason why I put the slide in here, because I want to show you um, three kind of tools um, where, which are important for us at Rubik or where we could contribute to, to apply uh, digitalization and industry 4.0. The first one is the topic of simulations. You can go to the next slide. Um, simulations are important for us um, as the technologies which we use, so nitriding, especially plasma nitriding and coatings, are relatively new technologies, uh, relatively unknown technologies, where it's very important to simulate um, processes, to simulate uh, what's happening inside the material. Um, so it's a little bit of, kind of uh, it's a kind of education which we also offer to show people why uh, or what is happening there. Um, where we also use those simulations is to um, what you see on the very first two pictures, on the middle one and on the left one, um, to simulate the furnaces themselves. So we have uh, configuration uh, systems where we can configure the machine for the customer. We can tailor made it uh, online or digital. And why do I mention it here? Uh, we were talking about large companies, about automatizations, about robotics. Um, but 
we, we must not forget that there are a lot of small and medium uh, companies, a lot of, uh, yeah, a uh, lot of companies um, probably not ready for that final stage of digitalization. And here I still have the possibility to, um, um, to, um, to show furnaces and potentials also with, um, um, in, also in a, in a, in a in a, in a smaller scale and um, our furnaces are very uh, uh, very modulized so there are always basic versions there is always the possibility to um, to be highly flexible for every application so also for the smaller ones uh, we are able to put all the furnaces via uh, augmented reality to the customer to show to check sizes to to put them online into their existing production so that's what why is it important for us or where we are using it uh, the next slide shows a little bit a um, little bit about data um, so of course everybody it's it's not an example that that everybody is uh, um, moving from from those big data more to smart data and uh, data analysis in machines is is important to to know exactly um, what's happening in the machine yes but also um, to predict things to know uh, when should I maintain my furnace uh, what is my furnace actually doing? How much energy do I need? How much gases do I need? That's actually a basic requirement, yes, but it's not state of the art everywhere uh, in the meantime. Um, but especially when, for example, energy is, is, is limited, uh, you can plan your furnaces, you can plan your processes um, according to the energy um, which you have available. Um, and all that's, yeah, it, it links together or, it, uh, or it's, it's connecting uh, all the machines and the data. And the very last one, we were talking about robotics uh, already, uh, but it's of course uh, also a topic here or a topic for us because the machines need to be, I said it already, highly flexible to apply them everywhere, to apply them in a small shop, to apply them uh, in a fully automatic uh, line. What you see here are a few automatic lines, fully automatic lines where the machines are, um, are introduced, for example, for the production of gears or for the production of, of valves or um, clutch components. So all of them are, um, yeah, of these modules where you can add or, or, or put away uh, things in order to, yeah, optimize it for the productions which are there. Yeah. Those are, as I said, uh, basically three applications or three approaches um, uh, I wanted to show you how we're approaching uh, this topic and industry 4.0. Um, of course, there is a lot more, but, <laughs> but today is, I think, uh, not the day where we go too much into detail with every company. Thank you very much. In the last page, you just have my um, and, and our contact details. Um, but in principle, I think the most important things uh, were said. Thank you. Yeah, information, of course, also with anyone uh, interested. Now, what I heard from your presentation, I think that's true actually for, for maybe a number of companies from Austria, is that uh, smart technologies or even digitalization of the industry may well uh, be a good case even for small and medium sized enterprises. And when we look at Vietnam, uh, Vietnam does actually consist of a lot of small and medium sized enterprises, especially when it comes to manufacturing. And if you look at the local sector here. So I would like to address this question to uh, maybe our Vietnamese panelists here today, Mr. Jung and also uh, Dr. Bing possibly. 
the question would be how do you see uh, this uh, from 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 a vietnamese perspective meaning that uh, we have a number of uh, small and medium sized companies here what capacities do they actually have and especially uh, what opportunities do you see for digitalization and uh, how digitalized or how automized are Vietnamese companies so far? Maybe Mr. Dion would like to, you would like to start on, on, on that. Uh, thank you for, um, thank you for your, <clears throat> for your question. And I think basically at this stage, um, the, uh, the, like, uh, like I said in the presentation, the good thing, uh, the, at least a good thing about the COVID-19 situation is that the it makes the companies and the, and the authorities in Vietnam aware that digitalization is imperative and it's un, and should be should not be delay any further. I think we we discussed the issues of industry 4.0 before uh, before 2019, and we, we also had the discussion on the digital transformation for 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 years already. But the but the COVID-19 situation. Really is really a game changer in the sense that we have to accelerate the process. So that's a good thing, and you you also see that the policies by the government, the the uh, different uh, specific policies will be will be elaborated very soon. And so that that is a good timing for the intern. Uh, so in the so the the space for for the for the SME to engage in the. In digitalizations and use of technology will be, in, will be increased. And the second thing is, uh, the second thing is at this stage, we have now uh, we have, uh, we also have a range of the FDA. Uh, FDA. So there is a, a market for that. There's a demand for that. And the foreign investor from coming in here have a stronger requirements with the SMEs in Vietnam. So that that is also a big push. To the firms to engage in that in that process, and not to mention the uh, future policies. I, I guess it will be coming next year about the financial support, the credit support to the firms to engage in mechanical engineering uh, and, and adoption of technologies. And the, and the, but I think one of the key challenges we might face with that is how to ensure that the uh, we have enough. The human resource to, uh, in in parallel with the with the adoption of technology, we have, we I think we we understand that the the improvement of the human human resource is also important, but uh, it's not it's not a rapid process. Nor it will be uh, tailored to the specific needs of the SME without the SME participation itself. And so this is one of the things we we will uh, a challenge. It's not something impossible to to overcome. But it's a big challenge that requires not just the effort of the government, but also the SME themselves. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Bing, would you like to share maybe only a few sentences also on that uh, topic? Yes, sure. I, I fully agree with Eng Zeng. And um, I think for, for small, medium enterprises, I think we, we have to be realistic here. Because when we talk about digital transformation, it involves a lot of different areas. I think the important thing here is that we need to understand that these small, medium enterprises, that they have a limited resources. So in terms of that, they need to, we need to help them to prioritize. Okay, each of the business needs to prioritize what area we want, do I need digital transformation or automation first? So which is very crucial for the operational <laughs> business. And then gradually building up on this, then I think it, it has to be a gradual process for the small medium enterprises, starting with um, the, the most uh, um, demanding areas that, that, that the small medium enterprise requires. So they cannot do everything at the same time. So this is uh, what, what uh, I have to say on this. Okay, well, great. Uh, we talked already a lot about uh, mechanical engineering here in Vietnam, and uh, this is a very strong industry in Austria. And it's also a very old industry in Vietnam. In fact, it's one of uh, the industries with the most needs for upgrading in Vietnam as well, as I believe, with many machinery being outdated. Uh, and uh, for sure, an industry with an enormous potential for the economic development of Vietnam. So Vietnam is traditionally uh, an assembler and a maker of certain low-cost uh, goods, but uh, this is about to change. 
and sourcing production of uh, mechanically engineered products from Vietnam will become a very big issue as we have already heard. Uh, from the Austrian perspective, um, we do have a lot of providers of machinery solutions, of course, and I would like to ask one uh, company out of that field, VFL Milturn, uh, a provider of machining solutions to share about their technology and products and, and maybe share with us how they use Industry 4.0 uh, technologies to improve the machines, please. Yeah, hello and welcome to Vietnam. Uh, can you start my presentation, please? Yeah, we can just start. Um, I'm the responsible sales manager for WFL Milton Technologies. We are located in Linz, Austria. We have around 450 people and we have an export ratio between 95 and 98%. So as, as Mr. Schwank said, it's quite, we are one of these which are exporting most of our production. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello? Can I jump the next slide, please? Okay, just to jump over this and just talk about three items, sensors, and multiple chaining, and machining of gears. This is uh, explaining our principle of our machines. Uh, we are combining a milling machine with a turning machine. That means milling, the milling process is integrated in the turning machines and we'll call the product mill turn, this is also our company name, uh, which gives you some advantages. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, that's not changing. I think that this quite slow. Uh, on the next page, you will see our, our technologies which we can uh, manufacture on the machines. It's not just turning a milling, it's much more. It's gear cutting, uh, deep forming, uh, internal. And here you see the advantage of, of the machining principle. On a normal uh, machining process on the left side, you see when you're machining a part, you have several machines, several steps. You do programming for all the machines. You have, for example, a turning machine, you have a boring machine, a milling machine. You have to transport the goods to each, to each station, each machine have different uh, programs. You have more labor cost, and at the end, the product comes out. When you're looking on the right side, these parts can be done in one machine. That means in, you clamp it one time and complete the machine completely. This is the big advantage. Of course, the machine is a little bit more expensive, but you get the higher a higher turnout and a better quality and several other advantages. Next page, please. This is just how our machine looks like typically. We have different ranges, of course. This is a, a medium size range. We're starting also with smaller sizes and getting up to bigger sizes, up to 60 ton work pieces, but we have also much smaller machines depending on the application and of course on the, on the branch which we are looking for. Next page, please. Uh, this gives an overview about Industry 4.0. Uh, of course, you have to collect a lot of data, and this data you can use to improve your quality of the, of the workpiece and also improve the process. And I, I just selected three items which are maybe interesting for you. Next page for you. Next slide, please. In a machine tool, you have several of, uh, sensors for coolant, for temperature, for vibration. I would say we have about 50 plus sensors in each machine tool itself. This is nothing new, but what is new maybe on the next, you can see it the next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, we can also integrate now a sensor in the cutting tool. The advantage is of course, if you have sensitive material or difficult material to machine, the tool itself can, can measure uh, vibrations and can send this data to the, to the uh, a computer and the computer can change the cutting data to improve the quality or, or reduce the speed or improve the speed just to improve the process and improve the quality. This is also very new. 
And there are several applications which are, they are quite useful, such as a uh, tool which integrates uh, 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 microchip. And on the video part later on, you can see if you look on the presentation, the video itself of the tooling. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example for multiple chaining, of course, you have to do a lot of robots and integration. Uh, this looks similar, but it's a little bit more. It's uh, four or four machines. And uh, the main robot, the orange, orange robot, the Google robot runs between the machines, but not only put in parts, put also in the tooling, put in also the chucks, put in also all clamping devices, except uh, doing the fully automatic system is not the automate the the operator need just to monitor it, but they don't need to change anything. No tool change, no no chuck change, no fixture change. Everything everything is done fully automatic. You can see it on the next next slide, please. Next slide, please. A little bit slow. Uh, and the the center part of this is the we call the central warehouse. It's a warehouse for the row parts for the clamping devices the tooling and the cleaning station. So if you change the tool or if you change the, the workpiece with different diameter, they can change also, for example, the, the chuck or, the, or the, uh, the jaws on the chuck, which gives the operator much more freedom as you don't make to make any manual intervention. Next, uh, next this is the last, last item which I present. Uh, machining of gears. Uh, we can machine also gears on this machine. Uh, we combine our gear cam system and our a special cycle system. With this, let's see, can I go to the next page, please? With this uh, systems, you can define the gear, then you define how I machine it with special tools, with special gear, gear cutting tools or standard tools, then you have to program it. For this, you can use the gear cam system. You can simulate it also with the, with the uh, gear cam software, and then you can use the special cycles for easier programming. And then you can produce the workpiece and you can also measure it on the machine. Next page, please. And these are gears which are possible to machine in our, our uh, machine tools, of course. Because many parts are, many shafts, many parts have some gear on it. And usually you need a special gear, a gear machine to produce it. But you can do this, of course, in our machine automatically. Next page, please. Yeah, the, of course, the... The main, main, uh, the main issue of our company is to clamp one time the part and machine complete the part. That's it. Thank you very much for the time you joined. Thank you very much, Mr. Seebacher. And uh, since further questions have uh, arrived, uh, and we'd also like to answer this, these questions, I would suggest that we now immediately introduce the last Austrian uh, company, and then we come to the Q&A part. We have already answered a few questions so far uh, from the audience, but more have arrived. So uh, speaking about the last company uh, and not, not the least company of Austria that we uh, will introduce today, that is Greiner Extrusion. Greiner is a big uh, Austrian uh, company for sure and uh, they're working with machines for the plastics industry. In this case, we're talking about extrusion of plastics. And I would like to ask uh, Mr. Chokri Karabach, please to uh, share uh, a little bit and introduce your company. And then uh, we will also show uh, a video which explains more in detail. Please, Mr. Karabach. Thank you so much. And uh, also after the video, maybe some closing words. My name is um, Shukri Karabach. I am uh, area sales manager at Greiner Extrusion and very happy to uh, be part of the panel today. Um, first two words about us. Uh, we are one Dota company of one big group like introduced uh, called Greiner AG Holding and uh, established worldwide. Greiner is uh, in the business since uh, the year 1860, uh, representing a, a team of 16,000 employees all ready uh, to serve you and totally oriented to meet the customer satisfaction. 
Rhino Extrusion is supplying actually state of the art and uh, from A to Z technological innovative industrial solutions to allow to transform plastic raw material in shape of powder or granulate into a plastic profile. So this profile can be a window frame profile out of PVC. It can be a, a seawall, a polycarbonate uh, light profile, an electrical cable duct, or wood plastic composite flooring panel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Vietnam today is already using our equipments. Uh, digitalization and uh, Industry 4.0 uh, occupy as well very important focus at Griner Extrusion. Uh, I want to briefly explain it before the video. So uh, what is it? Yeah, you know, during the industrial process, many daily difficulties happen. And industrials usually use to solve them through the involvement of human power. That is not always easy to find. This way of doing generates downtimes and scrap. So we developed a completely digitalized extrusion lines able to correct and react to those deviations during the production process in order to produce more efficiently, of course. So all goes in your return on investment on reducing your costs and allowing you to produce more and with less costs. So you have now a short video to have a, an idea how does all this look like. Digiline by Griner Extrusion. Automated extrusion for maximum savings. The new 15-inch DigiControl connects all line components and centrally controls the entire extrusion process. Weightmatic uses precise profile weighting to reduce profile weight and significantly reduces manufacturing costs. With Flowmatic, the functional dimensions of the full profile sections are ensured automatically, within seconds, and permanently. Digitank and Shapematic keep the geometry of the profile constant. Extrusion 4.0 with Digiline from Griner Extrusion. One recipe for all components for automated and error-free reproduction of all parameters across the entire extrusion line. Simple, fast, and above all, error-free setup. The recipe for the networked extrusion line and the pallet system for the tooling significantly accelerate the startup process. Typically, profiles are produced about 7% above the minimum weight. Who wants to pay for that? The target weight is simply entered in the control. Weightmatic compensates for variations in the profile weight and enables production close to the lowest weight tolerance. Each profile bar is weighted. Weightmatic reacts immediately in the case of a deviation. This allows profile weight to be reduced by up to 4%. Flowmatic ensures that the full profile sections are dimensionally accurate at the same time. Process fluctuations are also compensated. Flowmatic immediately detects the change in the calibration and changes the power of the heating rods in the die. The profile weight is kept constant with the aid of Weightmatic. All systems go. With Digitank, water flow and vacuum are digitally adjusted and controlled. The appropriate tank configuration for each tooling 
is already stored in the recipe. If a concavity differs, this will be corrected by Shapematic. Shapematic changes the vacuum in the digitank and keeps the concavity within the tolerance range. The profile measurement supports this. Maximum savings with Digiline from Greiner Extrusion. All right, thank you very so, much, uh, Mr. Uh, Karabach. Bef before, yeah, so. Be yeah, you would like to add still something? Quickly. Yeah, just closing a little bit the main idea. So, as you could see, so how exciting is it? Uh, is also like a robot, but just looking maybe a little bit different. Um, the general idea is to reduce or even eliminate many of these manual tasks that are still common in the profile extrusion. Um, we need to install, of course, sensors everywhere, measuring geometry, pressure, temperature, weight, color, everything you can imagine. But the most challenging part of it is actually to develop the features that can treat these values and react. React, you know, by correcting automatically the process all using in-house sophisticated softwares. So why do we do this? We do this to reduce costs and produce more efficiently. So this was the main idea. If you need any other additional information, please don't hesitate to visit our webpage or to get in contact with the panel organizations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Karabach. And yes, the, there is, uh, of course, an industry, a profile industry plastics profile industry here, uh, door window makers use profiles in Vietnam, but also other areas. And if you want to reach out to uh, this company or other companies, please uh, come back to us. We will also try later on uh, to make this uh, recording of today available for more companies in Vietnam and for everyone uh, in our network in the re relevant fields. So uh, before uh, we close, we still can answer, I think because we have a few minutes left, we can answer a few questions. Uh, there's one question I would like to ask uh, Mr. Sommer to answer to. And the question that came in is um, uh, about the role of uh, Industry 4.0 technology in the commercialization of R&D results and intellectual property uh, to promote the technology market development. So it's more about commercialization. Uh, and Mr. Sommer, maybe you can add from your experience in Austria here a little bit to that. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Very interesting question. And I would just um, highlight a few dimensions for that. First of all, we see that R&D platforms become increasingly powerful. And the reason is that you can have a lot of simulation. And just to give you one concrete example, when it comes to autonomous driving, um, you can simulate within one week or even less, one million driven kilometers. So, so you can see that parts of, of um, R&D data results, et cetera, can be used. Secondly, we see with regard to business models that increasingly there are platforms being built uh, where there's a chance to outsource parts of your R&D to your customers. And that maybe you are aware of these kind of configurators in cars, you know these configurators, but this is being done in, in various areas. And we see that on the one hand, you save money um, when you give something to your customer, but at the, at the same time, customer satisfaction is increasing because you have a constant um, cooperation with your customer. Third of all, minimum viable product is a trend. Um, some start with, with one lead customer, they, they collect data and rapidly improve the product or the product related services. And we see increasingly that, that this is very important because you have to be on the market as quickly as possible. Um, and, um, but there's also one challenge and we see it everywhere in the world. Um, and the challenge is to scale up from the lab size to a full production line. And, and this is something where you have this technology transfer where you have suddenly have completely different surroundings. Um, and and uh, I know that quite a lot of, of, of companies, of course, struggle with that. And there's a lot of support being planned or is already available in Austria. Um, 
And if you allow me another one or two minutes on small and medium enterprises to share the experience we have with, with uh, very good interventions from our Vietnamese friends, we see that particularly when it's with small enterprises, um, one of the, the um, you should start defining a project that is too much. You should find a low hanging fruit and then immediately try to, to um, implement that because the process of defining a project for particularly for small enterprises is sometimes too cumbersome um, and, and takes too much resources. Um, and, and there the, um, the challenge is to find this low hanging fruits. And what we also see when we look at small and medium enterprises, we, we divide between companies that tend to have an IT department and those who do not have that because these who have an IT department have more experiences in data analytics and then they need different tools in support than those who do not have. So we try to, to, to very significantly and, and um, individually address small enterprises without um, IT departments and those that have these. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thanks for the for the comment. And uh, we are also already uh, at the end of our of our webinar. So I would like finally to uh, give maybe back the, the floor for a very quick comment to uh, Dr. Bing from RMIT University. RMIT University is our co organizer today, as you know, and uh, because you have also an educational uh, point of view. So my question is, um, what, uh, how would you assess uh, the capacity in Vietnam, the readiness of Vietnam, let's say for manufacturing 4.0 from a talent or an educational point of view? Are there still uh, barriers or which ones? Maybe a very quick answer to round up the topic from Dr. Bing, please. Yes, thank you, Dietmar. Thanks everyone for the great presentations. and. Um, um, to add to the point that Ang Zung has already mentioned before, uh, one huge, huge challenge at the same time chance for Vietnam's manufacturing uh, is really the human capital. I think it is not only important to train the labor force to apply and utilize the current manufacturing technologies, but it's also crucial to develop a labor force with bright minds that can create innovative manufacturing technologies to establish Vietnam as a key leader in global manufacturing. I believe it is crucial for the long run growth of the Vietnamese economy to transition from a let's say value added manufacturer to a value creating powerhouse. I think this is the, the, the way that uh, we have to go. And to contribute to that, RMIT Vietnam has been really pushing the frontiers of business and technology education, supplying the Vietnamese economy with highly skilled graduates and leaders that are ready for the digital transformation. And as already presented by my colleague and associate professor Chung, RMIT Vietnam can be your trusted knowledge partner in Vietnam and Southeast Asia here in the area of digital transformation. And we are happy to discuss collaboration initiatives around research, knowledge transfer, training, capacity building, or other activities with you. So yeah, this is very much from my side about the educational side. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for these closing words. And uh, maybe I can ask our technician to uh, show all the participants again to to the audience uh, we are at the end of our session i would like to say thank you to everyone for participating in organizing it also for the panelists of course for the contributions i think there's great potential uh, for austria and vietnam uh, to uh, engage more in collaboration in industry 4.0 issues uh, in the future thanks so much and we as the uh, austrian embassy commercial section or advantage austria Ho Chi Minh City, we are here on site for any concerns, any issues that we may have, or any uh, opportunities that you, you may want to pursue in bilateral business. Thank you very much, uh, and have a nice day. Goodbye from Ho Chi Minh City. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.